Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to our webinar as uh, part of our winter 2021 series. And today, uh, our democratizing entrepreneurship uh, our session. Super excited to have all of you join us. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, we're excited to, to have uh, a couple of great guests joining us today to hear their stories and insights. And uh, really excited to, to speak about uh, a really interesting and, and top of mind conversation today as well. A couple items before we get going, uh, just with some, some Zoom etiquette and, and housekeeping items. Video is optional, however, would really appreciate it if you were to stay on mute throughout the webinar. If you have any questions at any point of time throughout the webinar, please pop it in the chat. We will be having a, a Q&A session following both of our guest speakers today. Uh, so please feel free to, uh, to contribute and to engage and ask any questions that, uh, that you have top of mind. Uh, and lastly, this webinar is recorded and it will be uploaded to our online resource section of our website. So if you do have to leave early, no problem. If you wanted to rewatch it, you absolutely can. And if you found value in it or think anyone else that you know would like to watch it, please feel free to share the link with them. My name is Joshua Zaprazan. Uh, I am the venture coach here at the Stu Clark Center for Entrepreneurship. And I have the awesome opportunity to mentor and coach students across the entire university, no matter what faculty they're in, uh, in helping them start their venture and provide resources and, and advice and mentorship to them. Uh, outside of that, uh, I am an entrepreneur myself as well, having built and sold a business. And I, I did go to the Asper School of Business as well and graduated back in 2016 with a major in entrepreneurship. That's a little bit about me. I would like to quickly introduce our awesome Stu Clark Center team, who's all on the call today too. Deborah Jonasson Young, our director, Lindsay Friesen, our program coordinator, and Leah Mickelson, our office administrator. If you have any questions whatsoever about the Stu Clark Center, about what we do, about how we can help you, help and support you, please do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us at any point in time. We're here to help and support your entrepreneurial journey, however best that we can. Check us out on our website, umanitoba.ca slash entrepreneur, and on Instagram at Stu Clark Center as well, where you can stay up to date on all the latest information, contests, upcoming events, uh, and everything. Quick reminder, the our new venture championship undergraduate edition applications are open and they are open until March 17th. So you have a great opportunity to win cash over $15,000, I believe, in total and prize money and, and have, get some really great valuable feedback on your business. So please, uh, if you have any questions about the competition or would you like to meet with me ahead of time to, to help prepare or have any questions with it, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. It is a fantastic opportunity for anyone to get some really great feedback on a business idea uh, and to practice pitching, pitching your business in front of judges and experts and, uh, and working on, on building a business plan as well. So wanted to note that. I also wanted to mention that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all of our webinars are recorded and you can see on our website at umanitoba.ca, if you click our upcoming webinars link at the bottom there, it'll take you to a page that lists all of our upcoming webinars, as well as recordings and videos of all of the previous webinars. So that is the best place to access those uh, if and when you want to, uh, to check those out and also see what these upcoming webinars are, as well as links to RSVP. So that's where, where to find those. On that note, we do have some amazing webinars upcoming. The one that I would like to highlight coming up following this webinar on March 8th is with Eric Termunde, where he uh, joined us a few weeks back, and he's joining us again uh, in a couple of weeks' time to talk about preparing and delivering the perfect presentation. So especially if you're planning to join any of the competitions, a uh, great, great opportunity to get uh, some insight into practicing how to pitch with a proper setup handling nerves, how to speak, uh, as well as a proper virtual setup as well. So definitely invite you to join any of an RSVP for any of our upcoming webinars. All right, so today, today we're talking about democratizing entrepreneurship. We are going to go through a couple of items. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to explain what does this mean? What is democratizing entrepreneurship? Uh, when we have, as I mentioned, two awesome guest speakers today, Ashley Richard and Wendy Yan who are really excited for you to hear a little bit more about their stories and their experience within this space and, and working with entrepreneurs. And then we'll, uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So again, any point in time, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we will get to them during that Q&A time. Awesome. So 
If you've joined any of our previous webinars, I always love to get started with a quick poll. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Simply, are you an entrepreneur? I've just launched a poll. It's completely anonymous. Would love your, your engagement and feedback. And uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to fill that out. Just about everyone has voted. Awesome. Oh, look at this close mix. Okay. I'll give you five more seconds. If there's one more person that wants to vote, if not, that's okay. Perfect. Okay. Let's share the results here. 55% of you are entrepreneurs. Awesome. 45% are not, but want to be. Well, super excited to have all of you here, uh, regardless of whether you are an entrepreneur or not. I think today's session will be very valuable. So uh, thanks for the engagement. Thanks for participating and uh, happy to have all of you here. All right. So let's, uh, let's begin to dive into it. So what is democratizing entrepreneurship? What does this mean? Essentially, when we talk about democratizing entrepreneurship, it's really this notion that traditional work, traditional jobs, they've, they've undergone this massive reset and jobs can be done differently and have to be done differently, especially moving forward as we progress through COVID-19 and, and any other disruptions that may occur. Democratized on its own really means accessible, easy to consume and ubiquitous. And as we relate it to entrepreneurship, William Gibson said that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. That certainly seems true for entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and raising, raising money and access to resources. While there is plenty of breathless reporting about the latest startups to come out of Silicon Valley or even anywhere in North America or here in Canada, the truth is that startup growth is relatively stagnant in many parts of the country and for large segments of the population. It's really no secret that the majority of startup founders in North America, they're usually overwhelmingly white and male, and many have family wealth to fall back on. If you live in the wrong place, didn't go to the right school, or just don't fit that traditional model of what successful founders look like, accessing venture capital and other resources can be a huge challenge. And it is something that definitely we as a community and as entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs need to recognize and need to take action to, <clears throat> to absolutely fix and address. Our goal as a, as a community and as a resource and as individuals and as other entrepreneurs, we need to make entrepreneurship accessible for everyone because it really is an opportunity for everyone to find a new career path, to reinvent themselves, to change what work might look like in the future for them <clears throat> and with a multiple different resources available for them into the community. So this really does start with education. It starts with the fact of understanding that anyone can be an entrepreneur and we need to make sure that there are resources available to support everyone on their journey to be an entrepreneur and bringing those underrepresented voices to the front of the table uh, and making that clear to understand everyone and their backgrounds and, and their beliefs and, and being able to provide that opportunity to everyone is super important. As a community, it really is our job to redefine what an entrepreneurship looks like, not necessarily thinking of a traditional entrepreneur and making it more of an inclusive space and providing those resources to absolutely everyone. As a very common theme that we say, and you've heard me say it a number of times, is that entrepreneurship is a career path too for anyone. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you're a science student, if you're a law student, if you're a computer science student, if you're an engineering, if you're male, female, anyone can be an entrepreneur. And it, at the end of the day, it starts with education and awareness and making everyone aware of the resources that are available. And as a community focusing on being inclusive, focusing on ensuring that we're able to provide equal opportunities and resources to everyone, regardless of their backgrounds. And uh, even as we talk about building teams within organizations and as entrepreneurs, having diversity as top of mind and inclusion top of mind, as well as the culture that you're building within your startup as an entrepreneur and be also being able to support others in our community. So at its forefront, that's really what the conversation today is about. And uh, I would love to slowly move into introducing two awesome guest speakers today. Uh, the first and foremost uh, is Ashley Richard. Ashley is uh, 
Really excited, first of all, welcome to both Ashley and Wendy. Excited for both of them to share their stories and the work that they're doing in this space to help democratize entrepreneurship. But Ashley is the National Indigenous Outreach and Partnership Development Specialist for the Women's Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. She is currently in Queen's University class of 2021 and a Master in Management Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. Ashley also holds a Bachelor of Commerce Honors degree from the University of Manitoba's Asper School of Business where she was the premier recipient of the full Indigenous Business Scholarship uh, at the business school as well. So Ashley, really excited for you to join us. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Definitely, and I'm really honored and happy to be invited today. Joshua, thank you for reaching out. Um, I'll start with a little bit about who I am, uh, and then I'll get into some of the work that I'm doing right now with Indigenous entrepreneurship. I guess you could say entrepreneurship was kind of bred into me um, since I was a little girl, but it's not something that I ever really realized. I think it's been um, a lifelong journey um, bringing out, you know, intrapreneurial and entrepreneurial capacities um, within myself. So uh, my spirit name is uh, Gagi Gayakwe, which means forever woman. And when I was a little girl, I asked my grandmother, uh, what does my spirit name mean? And she told me that it means I'm going to grow up to be a powerful woman, uh, even more powerful than me, is what she said. So my grandma was totally just the love of my life, my rock. Um, still to this day, I credit everything that I do um, back to her legacy and just everything that she shared with me and taught me. Um, my grandma was born uh, in 1940 in a small Métis community called Camperville, Manitoba. And she grew up with 14 siblings very poor and also during a time when there weren't as many programs and services uh, for Indigenous people that we see today. She was actually really instrumental um, throughout her career in getting a lot of these Indigenous organizations started. Like she worked really closely um, with the Niganan Center, with the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg. Um, you know, she ran in politics. She she just had this really, I guess, vivacious and courageous way of uh, working effectively with everyone, no matter who they were or what their political beliefs were. And that's something that I really look up to still today. And it's something that I um, try to, I try to model myself after her in how um, my working relationships with people carry out. So one of the last projects that she worked on before she passed away in 2010 was uh, she founded the Circle of Life Thunderbird House, which is uh, a building that's just at the corner of Higgins and Maine. It's in the shape of a Thunderbird. You might have driven past it if you ever drive by there. So the Thunderbird is all about the spirit of resiliency. And Higgins and Maine has been a corner that's just been long economically forgotten. You can tell by the busyness of all the buildings that were there that this was once a really thriving economic hotspot uh, in Winnipeg. But I think over time, what we've seen happen is when you when you drive past or through that neighborhood, you can see a lot of the effects or the residual effects of colonization and residential schools reflected in um, some of the indigenous people that are often um, in that area. So by putting the Thunderbird house there, my grandma wanted to bring the spirit of resiliency uh, to the corner of Haynes and Maine. So she always threw her life into um, these really big projects, but it was always about creating brighter opportunities for Indigenous people going forward. So I when she passed away, uh, I spent most of my time growing up in Toronto, but that was when I decided to move back here and continue the work that she was doing and just live and work in this community that, you know, follow the path that she had laid out to me with my spirit name. Um, my parents got divorced at a very young age. I was um, about four or five years old. So when my parents got divorced, I actually left Winnipeg. Um, and I moved to Toronto and I spent the majority of my life growing up uh, in Toronto. And it really wasn't until my grandma passed away that I felt this compelling need to come back. I felt like I had strayed really far from that lesson that my spirit name 
uh, like just the path that my spirit name was supposed to lead me on. Um, I actually have a story that is um, not uncommon for a lot of indigenous women and even you know non-indigenous women. Um, my family suffered really badly from you know diabetes complications and alcohol and addictions problems. And so by the time I was 26, uh, my entire immediate family on my dad's side had passed away um, from various complications related to alcohol, drugs, and diabetes. And these are diseases that I think can plague um, Indigenous communities. And uh, I also experienced homelessness at a very young age. Uh, I was sexually assaulted um, as a young teenager. And you know, so all of these experiences um, have shaped who I am. And I think the one thing about resiliency, like when I get asked, you know, how did you push through or how did you, you know, show resiliency through all of these troubles? It really is. I had a hard time answering that when I was younger. Um, one, because I didn't really think that my life story was that interesting because when you're in that life, you just, you see so many others around you who are, you know, going through the same trouble is that nothing really seems unique about it. It's just, it's, it was just my life. Um, and then I also, I didn't really know. I, I just felt like I had a choice. It was either survive or don't. It was like very black and white for me. Um, but recognizing that not everybody thinks that way. So I tried to think, you know, why did I think that way? And I really do have to just credit it all back to my grandma incepting me at a very, very young age, saying that my name means I'm going to grow up to be like her. So I always I started to question, you know, what am I doing to honor, you know, the teachings and time that she spent with me when she passed away. I was so heartbroken and so bitter. Um, if you've ever experienced, you know, the loss of a loved one, it's just the worst thing ever. It just feels like for a period of time, I felt like everything was going to be so pointless without her. I didn't want to go to university. I didn't want to um, work, get married, have kids. Like everything just felt really pointless if she wasn't going to be there to see it. So thinking about Forever Woman and what that means, I thought, you know, while I only had 20 years with her, that's still 20 years that I got in this lifetime to learn. And so what am I going to do with those lessons? So that when I came back to Winnipeg, I, I felt like I had to take a crash course in learning how to work and live in the Indigenous community here. Um, I didn't know anything about the political climate, the economic climate. Um, I only knew what my grandma had shown me, which was, you know, she would take me to ceremony. Um, I used to be a powwow dancer when I was younger. Like she showed me all of these rich and culturally beautiful things that when I came here and I, I learned about the contemporary topics that are, you know, that are being discussed right now in the Indigenous community, it was just as much a learning experience for me as it is for everyone else. So um, nobody is an expert in this area. Um, you know, being effective and working with Indigenous communities is a lifelong journey for absolutely everyone, Indigenous people included. So I got my start um, working at the Center for Aboriginal Human Resource Development about, I guess I came here like nine or 10 years ago. It was um, May of 2011. Um, the jets were just rumored to be coming back. There was a huge flood. So it was just crazy exciting times here in Winnipeg. Um, got a job working there and I really, for the first time, felt like I was doing the right thing, like I was on the right path and I was doing what I was meant to be doing. I applied uh, to the University of Manitoba and I really wanted to get into business. I, I don't really know why I chose business. Maybe it was because I, I think I had an initial inkling towards marketing. Um, but in any case, I called the Asper School of Business and um, because I had had such a different upbringing, my high school credentials weren't really um, up to par with where Asper would need me to be to get in. So it seemed 
really complicated. I would have to do all these things to get into aspirin. I'm a bit stubborn and I like a challenge. So I was like, okay, great. This is what I'm going to do. Um, so I actually spent a year and a half um, at the U of M before I finally got into aspirin. And I happened to come across this program called the Indigenous Business Education Partners. And they were the ones who really, really helped me um, get into Asper. And they had asked me, you know, how are you going to pay for university? And I thought, that's a really good question because I didn't know. I was just like, I guess I'm just going to work three jobs and like hope for the best. Um, and they told me that there was this brand new scholarship um, from these donors. And it was the first time that they were ever going to be giving a scholarship away. It was going to cover uh, all the expenses for um, one Indigenous business student. And I immediately just wrote it off in my head. Um, like I, I wasn't going to apply because my way of thinking was so rooted in good things don't happen to me. And the fact that there's only like one student is going to get this scholarship, it's definitely not going to be me. Um, so Peter Pomart, who's still um, at Asper, he actually, like, I, don't, I wouldn't say he forced me, but he was like, you don't even have to write an essay or anything. You just have to sign this piece of paper and we're going to submit you. So I was just kind of like, fine. And I signed it. Um, and then um, he told me that I was going to be shortlisted for interviews. Long story short, I ended up um, being the recipient of the scholarship. And when he told me, um, I still think honestly, like maybe that was one of like, definitely one of the top three, like happiest moments in my life. I'd say like the happiest moment would be something with my grandma. And the second happiest would be that moment. Like I just felt you know, this sense of almost something like, finally, <laughs> like, you know, finally, something's good is happening. Finally, um, I have an opportunity to really implement some of the lessons that my grandma taught me and do something uh, positive with my life. So totally threw myself um, into university, I took all that negative energy that I had um, when I was a teenager and just totally transformed it into like just throwing energy completely into um, working with the Indigenous student experience at Asper, working at the larger U of M community, um, Indigenous, and I just, I loved it so much. It was truly a life-changing experience. Um, I, I look back at my time at Asper um, very fondly. And, you know, I wish during my time at Asper, uh, being an entrepreneur was something that was brought up um, to me more often because I might have, you know, chosen entrepreneurship as a career path earlier on. Um, but in any case, my career has led me um, back to Asper, which is really great. So I'm working on a project right now called the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. And my position is based out of here at Asper. Um, we're one of the 10 regional hubs that are working on this project. So my role right now is focused nationally on building an inclusive innovation ecosystem for Indigenous women entrepreneurship. So it's about identifying the ecosystem, like who are the key players who are influencing Indigenous women's entrepreneurship? What are they doing? How can we work together? And what can we do moving forward to create more inclusivity and opportunities for Indigenous women entrepreneurs? Um, so Wendy, really looking forward to hearing your presentation because I do work really closely um, with the Indigenous Business Development Services team at Futurepreneur. They're so great, so enthusiastic. Um, so I've identified a couple key partners nationally um, who are working in the space of Indigenous women's entrepreneurship. And we're doing you know, a number of initiatives um, in order to make tangible and actionable change among the ecosystem and influence change with you know, like-minded doers, thinkers, change makers. It's really, um, it's really inspiring uh, to be in the room with a lot of these great minds who are really just passionate about democratizing entrepreneurship for Indigenous women. Um, last summer, uh, Deborah and my colleague Kara Thorvaldson and I, we actually participated in a traditional naming ceremony for the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. 
I thought it was really important to anchor the work that we're doing at WEC with a traditional name because of the huge impact that this project might have over decades and decades of time. Like the way my grandma has influenced the way my work and my ecosystem operates today, that is, you know, the position that WEC is in right now to change the future for not only Indigenous women entrepreneurs, but women entrepreneurs across the country. So what path are we going to follow and what are we account what lessons are we accountable to and so how I always come back to forever woman as you know something that really grounds me. I thought that would be great to ground our, our work at WEC in something so our traditional name is Miguam Makwa Ikwe, which means ice bear woman. And as it was explained uh, to us at the ceremony last year by Elder Margaret Lavely, she said the, the ice bear is the spirit of resiliency and courage. It's a spirit that you can find um, within Indigenous women entrepreneurs and also walking alongside them. So Indigenous women entrepreneurs are never without this spirit of courage and resiliency. It's always there. And I think that it takes an ecosystem of support to help bring it out of them at times. So how can we do that? Um, we hold a lot of national consultations directly with ecosystem organizations and Indigenous women entrepreneurs. Last year, we held a series of roundtables where we brought together over 350 participants across the country at different roundtables. And I'll end on this because I know I'm running out of time, but I'd say the two main takeaways that we took um, was the answer to the question, what would the future of an inclusive innovation ecosystem look like from an Indigenous woman's perspective? And the first uh, main takeaway was Indigenous women are really looking for a relational approach and not a transactional approach. So right now, there's a lot of fragmentation in the ecosystem in terms of like, go here for ideation, go here for funding, go here for support for writing your business plan. So how can we create something um, where there's a support person or an organization who walks them through every step um, of the entrepreneurial process. There's been this beautiful grassroots movement that's come up called the Indigenous Lift Collective. It's uh, a group of Indigenous women that meet bi-weekly and they just support each other, one another, um, no matter what they need. I think they regularly have about 40 to 50 attendees, but I think in the collective as a whole, I think it's uh, surpassed um, 100 Indigenous women entrepreneurs. So that's really beautiful. Um, Another key takeaway um, from that question was that the future of an inclusive innovation ecosystem for Indigenous women has to be by Indigenous women for Indigenous women. So that just means that Indigenous women need to be meaningfully included at the inception and development of any programs or support services that um, are going to be targeting that group. Um, so it's not about coming up with an entire program and then, you know, Indigenous women are the afterthought, like, okay, how can we like get 10% Indigenous women included in this program? Um, that's like, you know, kind of just hoping to like end that as a process altogether. And, you know, the same can be said for um, any of the BIPOC community, you know, just making sure that things are inclusive and collaborative um, and equitable in respectful ways. Just respecting that absolutely everybody has knowledge to bring to the table and mentorship isn't necessarily um, this one way exchange of information it's more circular and everybody has something to learn and everybody has something to bring to the circle so i'll end there and miigwech for inviting me again amazing thank you so much ashley you have uh, such an inspiring story and just before i do invite wendy up i'd love to ask you ashley i love the 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 comment and the relationship to resiliency. I think that's super cool and super impactful, especially as we talk about entrepreneurship. What would be your biggest piece of advice for entrepreneurs from a resiliency perspective that maybe are going through early stage struggles uh, within their life? I guess my biggest piece of advice would be and, you know, this is advice that we kind of give at WEC and, you know, CEO, if you're not familiar with them, they push this as well. It's ask for help. 
nobody likes to ask for help. I don't like to ask for help. Uh, nobody, and you know, I don't know why that is. Like we're all happy to like offer and give help, but nobody wants to ask. Um, and it's typically very uncomfortable, but um, knowing like just, I guess, how willing you would be to help someone. Just remember that there's so many people out there who would be willing to help you. And I think that, you know, just taking that first step and, you know, joining like a networking group, like the Women's Enterprise Center of Manitoba or, you know, the SCCE, anything like that, you know, just participating, showing up and asking can, you know, exponentially just push your career forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ashley. I'm sure that uh, a few individuals will maybe have some more questions for you during the Q&A time. So if anyone does, just a reminder to pop, uh, pop that in the, in the chat and we'll, we'll be able to get to that after. But um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you so much again for being here. I would now like to introduce to you all Wendy Yen. Wendy is the business development manager at Futurepreneur Canada. Wendy has a PhD in marketing. She has previously worked as a professor at the Asper School of Business and currently works with a number of entrepreneurs within the Manitoba ecosystem through the Futurepreneur programming and uh, is exposed to, uh, to a lot of individuals and, and young entrepreneurs specifically. And so really excited, Wendy, to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, and Excited to hear your insights and uh, into the youth segment of entrepreneurship and uh, and your space within democratizing entrepreneurship. So um, I'll invite you uh, you to the stage now. Thank you, thank you, Josh, for inviting me here today. Well, and uh, very happy to see everybody here today. And uh, yeah, my name is Wendy Yin. I'm the business development manager for uh, Futurepreneur Canada, responsible for Manitoba. Uh, well, I feel so honored to be one of the guest speakers uh, for Stu Clark Center today because, you know, I have spent uh, six years uh, at Asper School uh, for my PhD program. So it, I, told, I told them that it's a feeling of going back home. And uh, so this is a, a great opportunity to talk about uh, the experience and also my insights about uh, how to support young entrepreneurs. I actually, uh, I was uh, an instructor at Asper School for four years. I like to talk with my students. I realized a lot of people have the dreams or ambitions to start their own business, but they don't know how to start, where to start, when to start, what's the available resources. So I, in this case, I feel Stuka Clark Center is really doing an amazing job by providing this uh, workshop or series. So, and I love today's topic, democratizing uh, entrepreneurship. And actually this is also what I would like to share with you. Uh, when you decide to do one thing, the whole world will open the doors for you. So I'm gonna share my screen, try to, uh, introduce briefly about the resources you can approach. Can I, give me one minute, sorry. Okay. So, okay. So could you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank you, awesome. Betty. Yeah, so like what I mentioned, when you decide to do one thing, the whole world will definitely open the doors for you. And I suppose, uh, you know, most of our audience today are young people <laughs> from university, maybe students, university students. So the biggest challenges for young entrepreneurs are their lack of experience, their lack of a social network. And just because of this, the, it's very difficult for them to approach a traditional way to find the financial support, such as uh, from the bank. So their lack of capital. And because, this, because young entrepreneurs are considered a group of people with a high risk, just because of their lack of experience and social network. And based on this situation, supported by federal and uh, provincial government. Future Printer Canada is designed to help business owners aged from 18 to 39 years old launch a successful business across Canada. 
generally speaking, we are uh, offering financing, mentoring, and the business support for every business stage. Specifically, the, from the moment you have the business idea, you can join our free webinars, workshop, uh, workshop series, uh, such as uh, Rock My Business Idea, Rock My Business Plan, Rock My uh, Cash Flow, et cetera. And our excellent uh, entrepreneurs in residence uh, will help young entrepreneurs uh, turn their business idea into real business. And uh, after you are ready, when you are ready to write the business plan, we also provide free business plan writers and cash flow templates, which is available for everyone. And uh, so after that, based on your uh, different programs, depending on different programs, uh, your entrepreneurs uh, may receive up to $60,000 from Futurepreneur Canada and also our partner, Business Development Bank of Canada. And after you get the loan, you also will be matched with a mentor. Remember young entrepreneurs challenge is their lack of experience. So our mentors can provide you a guiding hand for two years, which is also free. So the mentors from Futurepreneur are usually established entrepreneurs or uh, people who are in industry for over 15 years. So their expertise, experience, and the social network will definitely be helpful. Well, so from this, so what I presented to you, you can see that Futurepreneur Canada is a solution to all the challenges. And by providing, you know, uh, workshops, uh, coaching, online resources, uh, mentorship, uh, entrepreneur community, as well as a collateral free loan. This is a very important and very uh, valuable for young entrepreneurs. So just now I mentioned uh, Futurepreneur Canada has uh, different uh, programs. Uh, so I just uh, briefly introduced uh, about uh, different programs. Uh, if you wanna have a full-time business, you can apply for a startup program, uh, which will be up to $60,000. And if you already have a job, do you wanna have a set hustle, like a part-time business, you can apply for our set hustle program. And of course, uh, our, uh, you know, Futurepreneur Canada has a great uh, program for indigenous uh, startup program, like uh, what Ashley mentioned before. She, we also work with our community partners uh, and uh, try to support the ind indigenous uh, group. And no matter whether your business focuses on products, service, or uh, you know, both product and the service. Even you are a student, you are also eligible for applying for our programs as long as you are in your graduating year. Okay, and also for Entrepreneur Canada has the program for newcomers. So, for example, if you come to Canada within five years and uh, yeah, without established credit history, you are still eligible for our programs. So you can see that uh, Futurepreneur has a different uh, programs uh, uh, for a variety of uh, like uh, entrepreneurs. So this is also the way to support our uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, like what, uh, what uh, Josh and Ashley mentioned, uh, we are working in an uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Futurepreneur is uh, proud to be one of the members you know, of this ecosystem in Manitoba. And we are not alone. We have a joint effort. We, we make a joint effort with uh, uh, so many fabulous uh, community partners uh, to support our local uh, entrepreneurs. And I believe we have the same goal to support, to help our entrepreneur to succeed. So, uh, this is uh, briefly just an uh, introduction about uh, what uh, Futurepreneur Canada can support our young uh, entrepreneurs. If you want more information, you can go to our website, or if you want to talk about your business, feel free to send me email. I will always be happy to help. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wendy. I uh, really appreciate the presentation and, and the insight into Futurepreneur. Uh, I am going to 
spotlight myself and also spotlight Ashley here um, and uh, we'll have a little bit of a conversation. If, uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them into the, uh, the chat here. Um, but I just want to begin by saying thank you to both of you, Wendy and Ashley, for sharing your stories and insights, uh, both uh, from your perspectives and the work that you're doing. Uh, it really is inspirational, as, uh, as we've seen comments in the chat here. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to kick uh, a couple of questions off by, uh, by just asking both of you from your perspectives and your thoughts, what uh, the concept of this future of an in inclusive working space and in inclusive uh, entrepreneurship space, what are your biggest pieces of advice that entrepreneurs can do to, to take action to helping to support our, our community uh, and, and create a more of an inclusive opportunity for entrepreneurs? Good question. I mean, there's a lot. <laughs> um, well, actually, so uh, based on the discussions that we had last year at those roundtables that I mentioned, um, we put together a report on um, Indigenous women's entrepreneurship and the future of an inclusive innovation ecosystem. And at the end of that report are about 30 to 35 calls to action that different ecosystem organizations can implement um, to ensure that they're really, you know, embodying inclusivity into um, the way that they're operating and moving forward. Um, a couple of the ones off the top of my head were, I guess, and it builds off what I said earlier, um, ensuring that Indigenous women are included, you know, in the inception and design of programming. It's it's not only about um, hiring um, Indigenous women to implement and design this programming. It's about, you know, an organizational shift of inclusivity. Like, is there or are there BIPOC or Indigenous women um, represented in the leadership or boards of the company that you're working for? I think. Um, I'll just I'll just really credit um, right now the Women's Enterprise Center of Manitoba because it's the first example that came to the top of my head. They worked really closely with me last year on you know building like a new program for Indigenous women and you know really about making it though this entire organizational shift. Like they did um, put an Indigenous woman on their board of directors and you know they were so excited to tell me it was great. But just you know taking it really seriously, like it's not about stats and numbers and you know it's really about that relational aspect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wendy, do you have any comments to add? Well, I would say uh, actually Fisherpreneur uh, like uh, make a lot of effort to, to support a variety uh, and the diverse entrepreneurs. We also have like uh, some programs for indigenous group. And uh, also in the coming one month, we have like a black entrepreneur uh, events. And uh, also, so this uh, kind of uh, inclusion values uh, from Futurepreneur uh, covers uh, everywhere and including our mentorship. Uh, so for, in order to support entrepreneurs, uh, we uh, gave the freedom and the right to uh, entrepreneur to, sub to, to choose who they want to approach and which mentor they would like to to you know connect with, uh, because it's for some people they would like to find a like a, a native speaker, or they want to find a man or women, female uh, female leader or ma male leader or indigenous or black uh, you know leaders. So these are all uh, encouraged, and uh, we try to make a local entrepreneurs feel, uh, you know, inclu inclu in in included and uh, uh, welcomed. Awesome. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ashley, there is a question in the chat here. How does the Knowledge Hub help Indigenous women entrepreneurs? And are there any services relationships to help social enterprises? 
Yeah, so at um, the Knowledge Hub, we're unique in the sense that we're actually one step removed uh, from uh, Indigenous women entrepreneurs directly. I think, though, just naturally by way of my position, I end up working directly with Indigenous women entrepreneurs, but we don't have tangible supports um, in the way like Futurepreneur has. So our role at the Knowledge Hub is working with the ecosystem of organization that does work directly um, um, with entrepreneurs and just making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're collaborating, reducing fragmentation and working with each other to move forward. Um, and are there any services relationships to help social enterprises? Um, you know, that's also a good question. And I would probably be able to answer it if I pondered on it for a bit off the top of my head, I can't um, think of anything right now. But there are, um, I did pop my email in the chat. So my I'd love to connect with you maybe one on one and I could hear um, more about I guess your personal business and situation and I could probably make some recommendations there. I also just quickly wanted to um, build upon um, Wendy's, uh, what she was saying uh, just earlier about, you know, Futurepreneur and the work they're doing. One thing that I've seen Futurepreneur do a lot that I think other ecosystem organizations are already doing as well, or, you know, maybe they could learn from is Futurepreneur shows up. <laughs> like Futurepreneur, there's a representative at every meeting I'm in, um, you know, like with the Manitoba Roundtable, with the WEC national meetings, with our Indigenous meetings, with our Indigenous finance meetings, like Futurepreneur is always there. And I think that that's a really important lesson and step to take is just, you know, showing up is so impactful. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Piece of advice and comment. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, we probably have time for one or two more questions here. Uh, but as uh, if anyone's pondering on a question to ask, I'll throw one more out to the two of you. Um, where do you see the biggest opportunity for growth uh, within the inclusivity space and democratizing entrepreneurship space uh, here specifically within Winnipeg? Mm -hmm. I definitely think that there's room um, to build capacity in like an indigenous with an indigenous social enterprise lens. Like how can, you know, indigenous communities solve, you know, those wicked problems of today um, in a sustainable manner. Um, one thing that I'm trying to work on right now is, uh, you know, working with Indigenous women who are aging out of the foster care system, um, but doing it in a sustainable way um, that generates revenue like a social enterprise, but is not like a full on like, you know, for profit, like group home situation. So that's something um, more complicated than I thought it was going to be when I originally thought of the idea. But I think, yeah, there's tons of room um, for social enterprise in in Winnipeg. Even if you drive down Selkirk Avenue, you know, you, you see so much potential driving down Selkirk. Um, I think and I think communities uh, can really help that that builds their capacity in order, like in terms of being self-sustainable. Um, yeah, that's my answer. Well, I would say, yeah, I would say that's a, a fantastic. And uh, this is also one mission for us, for this ecosystem to support the whole Manitoba. Because uh, not only just in Winnipeg, we also work with uh, like a rural Manitoba, uh, such as uh, some other community partners, uh, like uh, Community Future who take over the rural areas in Manitoba. So we also think there will be some space for developing uh, different areas in Manitoba. Uh, this is one thing. Another thing is uh, I feel that uh, uh, another option or another opportunities in the future would be uh, there will be some connection or collaboration with uh, some international business. Because uh, it, it, just uh, think about uh, the COVID, COVID COVID-19 really changed the world, changed the, the everybody's life. And uh, a lot of entrepreneurs think about uh, e-commerce, e e e or they try to collaborate with uh, some international suppliers or target market, and they try to expand their business to other areas or other countries. So I think that would be also space for entrepreneurs to think about. 
Awesome. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth within this whole or within the whole justice, diversity, equity and inclusion space. Uh, absolutely. And and room for opportunity, room for us to grow as a community, as entrepreneurs and continue to be inclusive, promote inclusivity and, and providing opportunities for everyone. Uh, thank you again so much, both of you for being here today. I'll just ask for each of you to end with uh, your, your top piece of advice for for entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, I guess I'd say, or maybe just a takeaway is about, um, you know, the language that we use um, in entrepreneurship. I mentioned earlier, um, like when I was at Asper, I wish, you know, entrepreneurship was presented as a career option for me. And, you know, the Sue Clark Center for Entrepreneurship was there when I was in Asper. And I think the reason I didn't identify with entrepreneurship was because when I thought of entrepreneurship, I thought of like the inventor, of, I don't know, someone who invented the broom or like Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. Like I pictured all these men and I would think everything's already been invented. There's nothing to invent. But as I've learned, you know, over the years about entrepreneurship and, you know, framing, it's about solving a pain point or a problem. And if I had known that that's what entrepreneurship meant back then, it would have totally changed my perception on everything. Um, so maybe, I guess, yeah, just being mindful of the language that we use around entrepreneurship, because I think um, it might that might be presenting a barrier right off the get go in terms of identifying with the word or the language that's being used. Love that. Thank you, Wendy. Well, my my suggestion is uh, don't be afraid of asking other people. And because, you know, like what I mentioned, uh, as a young people, as a young group, like uh, the group of young people, maybe we are lack of experience uh, or lack of a social network. But it, actually, from today's topic, you can say there are a large number of resources you can use. And uh, to be honest, when I was in university, I also didn't know what are the available resources? But after you know working with the Entrepreneur Canada and working with a lot of community partners, I realized that we have a lot of support, including government support, nonprofit organization support, community support. You know, they can cover different areas. So as a young, like as entrepreneurs, just reach out to different uh, department, to different organizations uh, to see what you can use, what you can, what you can benefit from. This would be really, you know, uh, great for your uh, business. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you so much, Ashley. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and sharing your insights uh, in this space. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your ideas. Absolutely. And everyone else, thank you for joining uh, the webinar today. As a reminder, feel free to check out our website on upcoming future webinars. Uh, don't forget as well that the Venture Coach program is also here for all of you, no matter who you are, no matter what space you're in or what faculty you're in. It's absolutely a free resource for students on campus. Uh, so don't uh, be afraid to reach out, ask for help, ask for support. We're here to help and support however we can. Uh, so look forward to hopefully meeting with some of you or, or all of you at some point in the future. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Enjoy some of this nice warm weather, stay healthy, stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar on March 8th. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.